As we prepare to hear the proclamation of God's word, let us join our hearts in prayer. Come Holy Spirit, as you moved across the waters of creation, drawing forth life, we pray you would move amongst us in these moments. Draw forth life from within us. Take all the voices within us and, and quiet them. Take our hard hearts and hold them open. Take our meager words and give them meaning. Come Holy Spirit. Amen. Our text is from the Gospel of Luke, the 10th chapter, a familiar story to you. We're going to start in the 25th verse and go through verse 37. Let us listen together for God's word to each of us and to the church. Just then, a lawyer stood up to test Jesus. Teacher, he said, what must I do to inherit eternal life? Jesus said to him, what is written in the law? What do you read there? He said, you shall love the Lord your God with all your heart and with all your soul and with all your strength and with all your mind and your neighbor as yourself. Jesus said to him, you have given the right answer. Do this and you will live. But wanting to justify himself, he asked Jesus, And who is my neighbor? Jesus replied, A man was going down from Jerusalem to Jericho and fell into the hands of robbers who stripped him, beat him, and went away leaving him half dead. Now by chance a priest was going down the road. And when he saw him, he passed by on the other side. So likewise, a Levite, when he came to the place and saw him, pass by on the other side. But a Samaritan, while traveling, came near him, and when he saw him, he was moved to pity. And he went to him and he bandaged his wounds, having poured oil and wine on them, and then he put him on his own animal and brought him to an inn and took care of him. The next day he took out two denarii and gave them to the innkeeper and said, Take care of him, and when I come back, I will repay you whatever more you spend. Which of these do you think was a neighbor to the man who fell into the hands of robbers? The lawyer said, The one who showed him mercy. Jesus said to him, Go and do likewise. Friends, this is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. So my favorite prayer book, the one that I use on, on almost a daily basis, is written, the prayers are written, by a man named Justin McRoberts. It's a contemplative prayer book. And interspersed amongst the daily prayers, he writes little stories, little vignettes about his life and how he sees them as stories of faith on his journey. One that captured my attention this week, a story of Justin's from this week, had to do with the time when he was about to fly home to see his family. He'd been away on a work trip for a week and a half. Uh, he missed them, and he was also worn out from all the work that he had done. Justin says he was sitting in his row on the plane, waiting to take off, when the flight attendant's voice came over the loudspeaker and said, Ladies and gentlemen, our flight today will be full. There are no extra seats on the plane and Justin says it was at that moment that he realized that the empty seat beside him would soon be filled with someone and he began to pray that it would be someone who wouldn't bother him at all he was tired and so in order to show that he was disinterested in any conversation he put his headphones on and he pulled the hoodie of his sweatshirt over his head and he he leaned toward the window of the plane he wanted to look as uninterested as possible in conversation. And that is, until out of the corner of his eye, he saw this little boy hop down the aisle and then right into the seat next to him. Justin pretended to be listening to his music to not pay attention to the boy until this little voice beside him says, Excuse me. I'm sorry. Hi. Sir? Sir? Um, I'm sorry. Justin says he took off his headphone, pulled down his hoodie, looked over at the little boy. He said, hi, can I help you? Hi, my name's Joe. Well, hi, Joe, my name's Justin. Then silence. 
Joe, do you need something? Yes. Can, can you help me put on my seatbelt? Justin reached over and, and took the belt and made sure that it was latched securely. And then he watched and taught Joe to, to tighten it on his waist there. And they talked for a little while, but after taking off, things quieted down a tad between Justin and Joe. That is, until the steward came down the aisle with peanuts. Justin says, I opened my two bags quickly and consumed the contents of both. Joe, on the other hand, sat struggling with his bags. He pulled and he tugged, and then, and then feeling defeated, he, he dropped those bags in my lap. In Joe's mind, it was my responsibility to open those bags of peanuts for him. Why? Because I was the person sitting next to him. And that's the way the world should work. Proximity should come with responsibility. And we should take responsibility for those near us. As I read that story this week, two things stuck out to me. The first is that the child is the one that teaches the adult about something very specific, what I would call the assumption of neighborliness. Joe assumes that the one in close proximity to him will take care of him, will help make sure that he is safe in his seat, and will make sure he has something to eat when he needs it. The second is, is that there is power, I realize when reading this story again, there is power and responsibility in proximity. There is power and responsibility in proximity. So I held this story as I began to wrestle with this parable of the Good Samaritan from the Gospel of Luke. This lawyer stands up ready to test Jesus. Teacher, what do I need to do to inherit eternal life? Jesus must know something's going on. He says, well, what's, what have you read? What does scripture say? Well, I should love the Lord my God with, with all my heart, and with all my soul, and with all my strength, and with all my mind, and I should love my neighbor as myself. You've answered well. Do that, and you will live. Interesting. The lawyer asks about inheriting eternal life. Jesus takes it out of the future tense and, and brings it to the present. If you love God in all the ways you've described and you love your neighbor as yourself, you will have abundant life right now. You will live. And if only the lawyer had stopped there, but he wanted to appear smart to everyone around. And so he asked the quick-witted question, and who's my neighbor? So often, Jesus didn't answer questions directly. He told stories as ways of answering the question, who is my neighbor? The man wants to show that he's just a little bit smarter than Jesus, and Jesus takes that question, who is my neighbor, out of midair, and he places it on the road between Jerusalem and Jericho. Notice, beloved, the setting the setting where Jesus places this story on the road from Jerusalem to Jericho. Martin Luther King Jr. described a trip that he took with his, his wife to the Holy Land. And on the night before he would be assassinated, he actually preached on this text and, and part of the description of his preaching had to do with the Jericho Road. He says, the Jericho Road is a dangerous road. It is a winding, meandering road. It is really conducive for ambushing. You start out in Jerusalem, which is about 1,200 feet above sea level, and by the time you're down in Jericho, about 15 or 20 minutes later, you're about 2,200 feet below sea level. That's a dangerous road, he says. In the days of Jesus, it became known as the Bloody Pass. And so Jesus situates neighborliness from the very beginning, from the outset of his story, as a dangerous proposition. To be a neighbor is going to involve some danger. 
So Jesus begins to tell this story. He positions it in a dangerous place. He tells of this man who is, is beaten and robbed and left for dead on the side of the road. But the hero arrives early in the story. The priest is making his way down from Jerusalem down to Jericho. He will be the one, of course, who will stop. It is his religion that the lawyer has, has just quoted. It is his religion that will call him to care for his neighbor as he would care for himself, to love God by loving his neighbor, except when the priest gets to the man half dead on the side of the road, beaten. He moves over to the other side of the road, and he keeps on his journey. He is unimpeded by the injustice that is right there before him. But then the Levite comes, again a faithful one, one who follows in the ways of God. And so we think, well, the priest wasn't the hero, but now the, the Levite will be, except when the Levite gets to this man, he does the same exact thing that the priest does. He moves over to the other side of the road. He cannot be bothered by that which is right in front of his face. Notice, beloved, the first two characters, the priest and the Levite, these are the ones who should have known their responsibility in the moment. Their faith is the one that taught of a commandment to love God with every bit of who they were and to love their neighbor as themselves. They claimed to live by this faith until we meet them on the road. And then it's the other side of the road and bypassing the one who is hurting that they choose to practice. Finally, beloved, a man of another race came by. As King describes it, this man, this Samaritan, he decides not to be compassionate by proxy. He gets down off of his beast and he administers first aid to the man. More than that, he puts him up on his animal, carries him to an inn. He tends to his wounds all night long. In the morning, he gives the innkeeper extra money. He says, take care of him. His life is important. Whatever you need to spend to take care of him, do it. When I come back, I will pay you for whatever it is that you have spent. Beloved, notice, Jesus does not use this parable just as an example of compassionate spirituality. As Rich Veladas reminds us, Jesus tells this story as a critique against religious passivity. The priest and the Levite, they pass by the man in need. But Jesus says in this parable, when God's people, when church people won't work for justice and mercy, God will find some other people who will. God is going to bring mercy into this world. And if the ones who say they follow in the way of God aren't going to be the ones who bring mercy, God will find another who will. What's more, it struck me this week as I wrestle with this text, beloved, it struck me that there are so many questions that have to be asked about the Jericho Road. We understand from 1,200 to 2,200 feet, it's a big drop in a very short period of time. It's a winding, meandering road. Why didn't anybody ask the question before it got the nickname of the bloody past, beloved? Why didn't anybody else ask, why is this road so dangerous. Why do people keep getting jumped on this road, robbed on this road? What is it about how this road was imagined or laid out or cut through the earth that leads to it being known as the bloody pass, a place where a man can be beaten and robbed and left for dead? Beyond that, why does there exist such a culture of fear that the ones who are supposed to to help, don't. Why are they afraid to help? Why are they afraid to come to the man's aid? Beloved, these are the questions that Jesus is forcing the lawyer and all the others in the crowd to confront, to examine. These are the questions that, that they must examine as a community, but these are also the questions that they must examine within themselves. 
And we must allow this story today to confront us in our lives of faith. What does it mean to love our neighbor right now? What does it mean that Jesus purposefully situates neighborliness as a potentially dangerous calling? What does it mean that the faithful followers of God are the ones that ignore the one beaten and robbed and left for dead, beloved? In this moment, if you find yourself worried, scared, fearful, even angry or frustrated, if you are wondering how your faith is calling you to neighborliness right now, then take heart because you are just where Jesus intended for you to be. You are just where Jesus situates the lawyer, just where Jesus situates the crowd. Justin and Joe, they get off the plane and they part ways Justin says, as I said goodbye to Joe, I hoped he would remain relentlessly committed to the way that he saw the world and that his hopeful optimism wouldn't be worn thin by disappointment. I hoped he'd keep expecting the people around him to live up to the best parts of themselves. I thought about the ways I expected so little of the people around me and even of myself. I expect so little to the point that generosity and kindness, compassion and charity, they felt like expectations to the rule of selfishness and isolation and disinterest. I recognize how I'd embraced a much sadder view of human behavior and relationships than I'd ever realized, one in which I expected people to hurt one another and cause damage. But what if that wasn't the case, Justin asks. What if I believed that neighborliness was a fundamental human reality and that variations from it were tragic departures from what God intended? What if a vision of the world made right was at the center of my thought process, of my psychology, how would I live differently? How would I love differently? Maybe I would quit far less often. Maybe I'd give weary travelers the opportunity to, opportunity to live into their better selves. Jesus finishes the story and he turns to the lawyer and he says, which of these three do you think was a neighbor to the man who fell into the hands of robbers. The one who only moments earlier imagined himself smarter, with a deeper understanding than even Jesus, responds, the one who showed him mercy. Jesus said to him, go and do likewise. May the words of our Savior echo in our hearts as we wrestle with how we are called to neighborliness in this season. In the name of the Father, and the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Amen.